good to have Karen back, right? Um, let me start by saying thank you for putting up with me last week. <laughs> so um, I still have a little bit of a cough. I'm praying it doesn't decide to make an appearance this evening. <coughs> and there she comes up to me. Anyway, last week we spent a good bit of time on the call to yield to his Holy Spirit. And we talked of the involvement of our will in the yielding. And unlike the law, we called it the stop sign, that forces us to obey, God has granted us freedom to choose what or whom we will serve. And Paul called us to be led by his Holy Spirit. But as we yield and keep in step with his leading, rather than the deeds of the flesh taking front and center, his grace that works will bear the fruit of Christ's character in us. We spoke of the personal spheres of our lives, the flesh that manufactures it, its deeds, beginning with the inward, a serving of self that leads to serving false gods and unleashes all manners of chaos and disharmony within our communities. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, Jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we saw the glaring contrast as the Spirit produces His fruit, always beginning with the upward, in the likeness of the person of God, and then manifests the fruit of God's nature and character in our inward selves and ultimately to the outward to those with whom we encounter in life and the fruit of the spirit love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control against such things there is no law and as we yield to his grace and reckon our crucifixion with christ as the truth we will live we will walk we will keep in step with his leading and Paul said, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And remember we said that we can't crucify ourselves. But it, as we believe that we were crucified with him, as we reckon that to be the truth, we begin to realize that as a reality in our life. And then remember how Paul ended this contrast between the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit with a call to be mindful of our interactions with others. For, as we learned from David Jeremiah, it is in our personal relationships that the flesh most often appears. And so Paul ended that section with, let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. And from there, Paul will go on to provide the Galatians with a bird's eye view of what a community of those who are yielding to the, to the Spirit can become, as he points us to his grace that works to manifest his fruit. And this community is one involved in working the harvest for God, as we were also reminded last week that fruit is never grown to simply be put on display. Fruit is meant to be eaten, and not just by us. We are called to bear fruit that we might feed others with the life-giving sustenance of the fruit of the Spirit. His love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And now this evening, we are going to consider the reality that fruit must be sown. I mean, let's be real. No one comes upon a fruit orchard that accidentally planted itself. And in our portion of study tonight, we will see his grace that works as we sow to the Spirit. As Paul exhorts the Galatians to become a community that's intentional in sowing and reaping. That there would be an abundant harvest of the fruit of the Spirit. Now remember, I grew up in the 60s. Times were tumultuous and young people were confused. And two psalms come to my mind when I reflect back on this time of uncertainty and need in our country. In 1965, Jackie DeShannon's recording of What the World Needs Now is Love was released and eventually hit number seven on the Greatest Hits chart. 
In this song, the singer speaks to the Creator and calls Him Lord and respectfully tells Him, Lord, we don't need more of your beautiful work that we see in this creation. We don't need more mountains and hillsides and meadows and sunbeams and moonbeams. We have so much of that. What we need, Lord, because there's just too little of it, is love, sweet love. Two years later, the culture shift was explosive, and at the height of the peace and love movement, the Beatles were transitioning from their simple love song music that had been referred to as toe tap and ditties into their soul searching psychedelic sounds. And in 1967, the revolutionary sound of their magical mystery tour album was released. And on that album was the song, All You Need Is Love, a song that spent 11 weeks on the greatest hits chart as number one. The whole premise of the Beatles song, whatever needs to be done or sung, made or saved, known or shown, in order to be the real you, it can be learned. How? All you need is love. Problem? What was the Beatles' definition of love? I would venture to say that Jackie DeShannon's song of the need for love was much closer to what we really need, as she made her request to the Lord, unlike the Beatles who exhorted us to turn within to learn it. But now, almost 60 years later, the world is certainly no closer to living out the ideas of those in Jackie's song why? I think because the world has followed the advice of the Beatles. Find it in self. Here's a little blurb from the song. There's nothing you can do that can't be done. Nothing you can sing that can't be sung. Nothing you can say, but you can learn how to play the game. It's easy. Nothing you can make that can't be made. No one you can save that can't be saved. Nothing you can do, but you can learn how to be you in time. It's easy. But I don't think easy is how I describe it. Could you? And as we said last week, most Bible scholars agree that Paul began the fruit of the Spirit with love, as all fruit is really an outgrowth of his love. It is his love that both fulfills the law and forms Christ in us, and it is love that is so very often misunderstood. As Paul pointed out last week, when we live our life yielding to self, Anything but biblical love emerges. What rears its ugly head is actually self-love. In Paul's last letter penned to Timothy shortly before his death, he wrote to Timothy of what to expect from those who live a life yielding to the flesh. Realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And where does the rule of flesh have its inception? Inwardly, first, lovers of self. And the truth be told, we throw that word love around like it's candy. I love chocolate. I love the beach. I love the bulldogs. Nah. I love the theater. Oh, yeah. We all have our own areas of interest that we say we love. But notice in each of my previous examples, what I love has no requirement placed on me. I'm the recipient of what I love. But is that really love? Well, in today's culture, sadly, many do seem to think so. Love often has ourselves as the focus, and if there is not some sort of experiential payoff for me right now, then it must not be love, and I'm out. Our world has bought the flesh-driven version of love. If it makes me feel good, then it's love. And the truth is, our world is no different today than in the 60s, and no different today than back in Paul's time. The enemy is relentless in his lie of what love is. But as we learned last week, we have been set free to yield to his spirit 
so that he would bear his fruit in us. Not to be consumed by us, but that we would be a source of sustenance to others. For we are called to show the love that Jesus expressed. His love gives sacrificially with no payoff for himself. The night before his betrayal and arrest, his ultimate love sacrifice, he demonstrated love in service. When he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And he then went on to call us to become a community that would become known as his. How? By loving others the way he loved us, through sacrifice and service. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. He called it a new commandment. But we know the command to love was not new. He had already told us the greatest commandment had been given, the commandment that everything else depended on. When he was asked, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So loving one another was not a new command, but it was the command to love even as he has loved us that was new. And this was to be the mark of those who claim to belong to him, a mark that is meant to be evident to all men. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. What kind of love? As I have loved you. And in the next chapter of John, Jesus went on to let us know that we could actually know if we are really loving him. Because love for Jesus will result in obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's pretty straightforward. But wait a minute. <clears throat> Hasn't this whole book of Galatians been about the fact that we are no longer obligated to the law? So what did Jesus mean? Well, he also told us that the whole law actually depended upon if we keep those two greatest commandments, love God and love others. And a community that is intentional on loving God and loving others will be a people intent on sowing to the Spirit. Because again, as David Jeremiah reminded us last week, community is an optimal breeding ground for the works of the flesh, unless we first yield to the Spirit and are then set apart to work that field. What Paul calls the Galatians to is not to keep the law, but to yield in love. And to sow to the Spirit. Each exhortation given in verses 1 through 10 of chapter 6 on how to do life together as Christ followers and lovers of one another can be defined through the lens of the fruit of the Spirit. There are other ways we could examine this passage, but I found it so fascinating to see the thread of the fruit of the Spirit woven throughout. And so this evening, we will, in that way, approach this passage. And of course, we will be reminded once more that apart from his grace, we can do nothing. But if we will love him and depend on his grace that works so as to obey him, he will lead us in preparing the field for his harvest. As he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The fruit of the Spirit is exactly that. His fruit, perfectly manifested in Jesus Christ, 
who came to fulfill every jot and tittle of the, of the law through his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And it's imparted to us through faith. And it is out of this private life with God that we will then be of public use for his kingdom. Consider what Oswald Chambers said about this. We make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. It requires a conscious decision and effort to keep our primary goal constantly in front of us. It means holding ourselves to the highest priority year in and year out. Not making our first priority to win souls or to establish churches or to have revivals, but seeking only to be well-pleasing to him. My worth to God publicly is measured by what I really am in my private life. That slaps to me right across the face. I hope I'm not the only one getting beat up. And while these first 10 verses that we're going to look at tonight in chapter 6 seem to be addressing the public ministry within this local body of believers, the actions we are called to are the actions of Christ, of his life being lived through who we really are in our private life. That which is well-pleasing to him and evident of his grace that works as we sow to the Spirit. Paul begins by calling us to sow to the Spirit the fruit of gentleness towards those who have been caught in a trespass. Remember gentleness, meekness, and humility, the power to control your reactions to difficult people and situations and not to be confused with weakness. Mm -hmm. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself that, so that you too will not be tempted. You who are spiritual, you who in your private life are pleasing to God. This word caught, if anyone is caught in a trespass, mm -hmm. conveys the idea of being taken by surprise, like being ambushed. Again, this is a tactic of warfare. And the enemy is crafty. And when one of our own is suddenly caught unawares, it is not time to join the Pharisees and pick up our stones. Paul reminds us that none of us are exempt from this kind of assault. And if we will but remember that we too are vulnerable, won't we seek to gently restore a sister the way that we would pray someone would treat us? if we were caught unawares. The fruit of gentleness reflects the humility of Jesus. Remember, he said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. As we sow to the Spirit, his grace that works will produce a harvest of gentleness, the harvest of meekness, humility, and the power to control our reactions to difficult people and situations, and it's not to be confused with weakness, because the truth is it requires strength, his perfect strength. The fruit of love, sacrificial unmerited deeds to help a needy person, the greatest of all virtues as described in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is the power that moves us to respond to someone's needs with no expectation of reward. And Paul wrote, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. The ultimate act of love was demonstrated on the cross when Christ bore the burden of our sins. Now obviously we can't bear another's sins on the cross, but we are called to love in such a way as to come alongside and help carry the weight of our sisters and brothers burdens this word burden refers to a heavy weight life has more than its fair share of weighty problems and we're called to help carry the weight through counsel through prayer through loving others the way we want to be loved 
when we are heavy laden. As Paul had written in chapter 5, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The ultimate love was proven in the Father giving his greatest gift in his Son, Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And we look most like Jesus when we so love others that we are moved to respond to their needs without anything in it for ourselves. As we sow to the Spirit, his grace that works will produce a harvest of love, the harvest of sacrificial, unmerited deeds to help those in need as we are moved by his power to respond to the needs of others with no expectation of reward. The fruit of self-control, victory over sinful desires, the ability to restrain inappropriate passions and appetites. Paul wrote, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. I think we so often think of self-control as having control over those nasty, corrupt desires of the flesh. You know, the big sins. But is there anything nastier than the self-deception of pride? Remember when Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount? His concern went right to the sins of the heart. Self-control restrains our inappropriate passions and appetites for self-love so that we are enabled to humble ourselves like Jesus and put others before ourselves. As Paul wrote about Jesus in Philippians, Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, he, is, he had something to think he was something about. But he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Self-control restrains the inappropriate passions and desires for making ourselves something. And as we sow to the Spirit, his grace that works will produce a harvest of self-control, the harvest of victory over sinful desires, and the ability to restrain inappropriate passions and appetites. The fruit of peace, harmony in all relationships, both a supernatural calm amid chaos and the ability to bring harmony to divided factions. And Paul wrote, but, exam but each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. Nothing can cause disharmony like the comparison trap. We live in a culture that crams it down our throat, sowing seeds of discontent because we don't have what they have. We don't look like they look. We don't go where they're able to go. But God's peace is imparted when we have been given in Christ who we are in him. God's peace comes through Christ in us. The comparison trap is replaced by the compassionate treatment of others. For he has broken down the walls of division and by his death he has made us one. In Ephesians 2.14, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility. And as we sow to the Spirit, his grace that works will produce a harvest of peace, the harvest of harmony in all relationships, bearing the fruit of a supernatural calm amid chaos and the ability to bring harmony to divided factions. The fruit of patience, putting up with others, even when severely tried, the quiet willingness to accept irritating or painful situations. As Paul wrote, for each one will bear his own load. Some find this verse to be a contradiction with what Paul had said in verse 2, where he called us to bear one another's burdens. But they are two different words that Paul calls us to bear. As we said previously in verse 2, Paul refers to the weight of the burdens that we encounter in life. But here in verse 5, we're instructed to bear our own load. This word load 
refers to the freight of a ship, a task, or service, and was also used to refer to a soldier's pack, carrying that which is needed to follow his commander. And sometimes we could find we find ourselves wishing that we could trade our pack for someone else's. Our pack of struggles in life, our pack of disappointments, our pack of sufferings, because the grass can certainly look greener on the other side. We've probably all heard it said, don't, pay, don't pray for patience, because if you do, God will surely bring all kinds of awful situations that require patience. And again, truth be told, learning patience definitely comes at a cost. And we might find ourselves wanting to buy the t-shirt I had my patience tested. I'm negative. <laughs> but as we bear our own load with patient faith, we follow the perfect and positive example of Jesus so that others would believe him for eternal life, as Paul wrote to Timothy. Yet for this reason I found mercy so that in me, as the foremost, referring to himself as a sinner, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. As we walk in obedient love for our commander-in-chief, we will be enabled to accept the painful situations with his patience, with a heart's motivation that others might believe in him. So as we sow to the Spirit, his grace that works will produce a harvest of patience, the harvest of putting up with others, even when we're severely tried, with a quiet willingness to accept irritating or painful situations that others may come to believe in him. The fruit of kindness, doing thoughtful deeds for others, generosity and consideration towards others. And here Paul says, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Paul here instructs the Galatians to provide for their teachers of the word as he expounds on the law of sowing and reaping. As the teacher sows the word of God, believers are called to join him in the sowing through providing for his physical needs and freeing the teacher to continue in his call to teach the word. It is again a call to put the needs of others above our own for the sake of the kingdom. And as we are generous in our kindness towards our pastors, we grow in our likeness of Christ, who always generously consider the will of his Father above his own needs. He spoke, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. As we sow to the Spirit, his grace that works will produce a harvest of kindness, the harvest of doing thoughtful deeds for others with generosity and consideration toward them. The fruit of faithfulness, trustworthiness and reliability, enduring loyalty and trustworthiness. And Paul wrote, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And here the law of sowing and reaping is expressed through our understanding of the laws of nature. To begin with, like we said earlier, fruit orchards don't come into existence accidentally. If we desire to reap, we must sow, and what we desire to reap is what must be sown. David Jeremiah's study Bible quoted from John Stott. According to John Stott in the message of Galatians, his, his commentary, sowing to the flesh, this, this will kill you, sowing to the flesh means to pander it, cover it, and stroke it instead of crucifying it. Every time we allow our mind to harbor a grudge, nurse a grievance, entertain an impure fantasy, or wallow in self-pity, we are sowing to the flesh. Every time we linger in bad company, whose influence we know we cannot resist, 
Every time we lie in bed when we ought to be up and praying. Every time we read pornographic literature. Every time we take a risk which strains our self-control, we are sowing to the flesh. Some Christians sow to the flesh every day and wonder why they do not reap holiness. Holiness is a harvest. Whether we reap it or not depends almost entirely on what and where we sow. That's a lot. And we also know that reaping does not occur instantaneously. The growth that leads to harvest requires time. It requires trustworthy endurance as we wait on the one who will bring his harvest. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls, and he will also bring it to pass. And as we sow to the Spirit, his grace that works will produce a harvest of faithfulness, the harvest of trustworthiness and reliability, enduring loyalty and trustworthiness. The fruit of joy and inner happiness not dependent on outward circumstances, an inward hope and exuberance in spite of outward circumstances. Joy differs from happiness, which relies on favorable circumstances. One thing, oh, and Paul wrote, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. One thing is sure, unlike the Beatles, God never said that living in community would be easy. People rub each other, and that causes friction, and friction so easily fuels the flesh. So we must choose to lay aside the things we find so irritating in one another by looking to Jesus as our perfect example of inward hope in spite of outward circumstances. In Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance, enduring faithfulness, the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God. As we run in anticipation of the joy ahead of us, we run like Jesus. Our eyes are to be fixed on our eternity with him. For we know in due time, we will reap. But due time is not defined. Don't we so often wish for a timeline? But God's timing is always perfect. And as we fix our eyes on Jesus, and so to the Spirit, His grace that works will produce a harvest of joy. The harvest of an inner happiness that is not dependent on outward circumstances. An inward hope and exuberance in spite of outward circumstances. Relying on the hope we have in Him, not favorable conditions in this life. And the fruit of goodness. Showing generosity to others. Moral excellence. In verse 10, so then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. God calls us to community. For just as it is in our personal relationships that the flesh most often appears, it is also in our personal relationships where the Spirit of God has the greatest opportunity to bear his fruit. Oswald Chambers. Beware of isolation. Beware of the idea that you have to develop a holy life alone. It is impossible to develop a holy life alone. You will develop into an oddity and a peculiarism, into something utterly unlike what God wants you to be. The only way to develop spiritually 
is to go into the society of God's own children. And you will soon find how God alters your set. God does not co contradict our social instincts. He alters them. We are in such need to be altered because of our natural inclination. Our natural social instincts set our sights on ourselves. As we sow to the Spirit, God will alter our sights to align them with His Spirit. Now, I imagine God could have set His plan of salvation into motion to be totally accomplished in the heavenlies without any interaction with flawed, sinful me whatsoever. He's God. But that is not how He chose to do it. He chose to send His Son to dwell among us and to take every opportunity to do good to all through his healings and teachings, fulfilling the prophecies spoken about him. When evening came, they brought to him, Jesus, many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. But his ultimate goodness is to those who are of the household of faith. As he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. We are called to do good to all, and especially to the family of God. As we sow to the Spirit, his grace that works will produce a harvest that will feed the hungry with the bread of life and quench the thirst of every thirsty soul. As we sow to the Spirit, His grace that works will produce a harvest of goodness, the harvest of showing generosity to others with His moral excellence. Imagine a community that is intentional, not relying on accidents, but intentionally sowing to the Spirit so that the fruit of the Spirit would abound. This evening, may we choose to yield to his spirit and deny the flesh so that his grace that works as we sow to the spirit, we become evident in a world that is desperately in need to see a bit of heaven's harvest here on earth. Amen. 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 Next week, we will, oh, sorry, I didn't, here we go. Next week, we will wrap up with Galatians, the last verses 6, 11 through 18. So we're so excited. And then the, then we have Thanksgiving. And then the next week we will come together for a teaching and just some fellowship. We'll have a, a few little snackies. Eat dinner. Don't, don't plan to be fed. Um, but <laughs> some snackies and fellowship um, around the word of God. So let's pray and we'll go to our small groups. Heavenly Father, we stand amazed at how you have provided for us and how you have sent your Holy Spirit to lead us, and how you patiently put up with us, and how you love us, and how you find joy in doing that which accomplished our salvation. Father, we're so humbled and we're so grateful, and we desire to be more like Jesus, God, that we would interact in our community as those who sow to the Spirit and are filled with the fruit of your spirit. Do a work in us, I pray, Lord God, that only you can do, but that we would cooperate as we yield to you. In Jesus' name.